Uh, welcome back to Progressive Talk with Dave from Progressive Resistance Media and Josh here from New Progressive Voice. Welcome back, Dave. Hey, how you doing, Josh? Doing fine, thank you. You're so, good. been a pretty interesting week. We had a Bernie Sanders town hall at CNN, Marianne Williams and CNN town hall. Uh, we had Marianne Williams in meeting with Jimmy Dore. We had Andrew Yang giving us more information on his UBI. We have some wild cards out there regarding Trump and his rhetoric. So those are some of the things we'll be covering today. So okay. did you get a chance to see Bernie Sanders CNN town hall? Uh, yeah, total hit job. Uh, <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was a total hit job. It was like worse than I thought it would be. You know, like someone was saying it was in DC is where all the hard questions are, where all the lobbyists are. Where, where it's going to be, you know, really hardball questions and whatnot. Well, this this was in New Hampshire, I believe, and it was five times worse than any D.C. town hall I've ever seen. And if you watched the memes on the Internet of the week, they were all over with the one woman asking a question about uh, what was it? Given the Boston bomber the right to vote. I think that was yeah, one of that, them. that one and the other one about like uh, her, her family escaped uh, Stalin or something or socialism. Right. I forget. Right. So he came out in support of everyone, including those with felony that aren't currently incarcerated, being able to vote. What are your thoughts about that? <sighs> OK, yeah. So he was disingenuously framed on this question. Uh, I, first of all, I personally believe that you know, everyone in prison should be able to vote. Everyone, no matter who you are, uh, the, the smallest criminal to the most vicious criminal, uh, no matter who they are, they have the right to vote that should be protected. Uh, and I believe Bernie is the same way on this. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the question that was asked was disingenuously framed to, you know, focus in on the on these these people who are the worst in society, like the Boston bomber. Or uh, maybe she mentioned rapists, or, or ju just the most horrible people. They they made him isolate on there, so it's basically saying, "Oh, look at Bernie Sanders. He's he's even for murderers and their rights. He's for rapists and their rights." When really the con it's a broader conversation. It's a broader scope where he's for everybody, no matter who it is, crime they've committed. But once again, disingenuous framing, they tried to make him look really bad there. Uh, and, you know, it's just fodder for establishment. I kind of think of it a smaller example of a larger general society. You have people in general society that commit crimes, maybe small misdemeanors, running a stoplight, stealing bread, sure. robbing someone, uh, graffiti. Uh, they have the right to vote. Uh, so everybody in that society has the right to vote, despite that small percentage of people having really bad behavior in general society. So prison is just a smaller society. It has its own culture, subculture. And you have some that are really, really bad. And then you have the most that have committed some crimes that maybe are not quite as bad. Maybe, for example, marijuana. They're still in prison. That's the way I look at it. I think that those can be comparable to one another. Yeah, totally. And, and like I said, they were just trying to isolate it on the worst, most violent offenders just to disingenuously frame it. And it worked because my mother even came up to me and, and, and she said, oh, the one thing le leaped out at me, like, I can't believe Bernie wants to let those people vote. Mm -hmm. So you see, it works on certain people. OK, right. who don't go that deep, who just hear that, that Bernie went to bat basically for the bomber person, a rapist. You know, see, that really sticks in. That's a very, that, that's a political maneuver. That it's a very, you know, like I said, he was set up worse than any other right. town hall I've ever seen, and it worked. All the other candidates on the stage on Monday night, they pretty much just gave easy questions, you know. Oh, right, yeah. Ernie's a he threat. talked about that being a slippery slope that, well, you, you know, you did this, so you don't get to vote. Well, you did that, so you don't get to vote. And I thought that that was a good argument. That's it. Yeah, that was the part I forgot. He said it is a slippery slope argument. You're just going then it's like, where do we go from there? We set a president where we're going to restrict certain people in their voting rights. Where is that going to go next? So that was it was good to bring that up. It's a slippery slope. Talked about him now being a millionaire like they did. They drug that out again, as they did in Fox News. They talked about 
what is his viewpoint uh, about Trump being impeached? And they actually was high, were highlighting that as the high point in his CNN town hall. Media everywhere was positively speaking about Sanders because he said, you know, we need to look at it and, and see whether or not, you know, he did obstruct justice. Just go in cautiously, but not make that the centerpiece of, of our uh, message. Yeah, he was saying uh, basically, if we if Democrats go after Trump instead of going after him on policy, the Democrats are going to lose in 2020. So, right, right. He wants to, he wants an investigation, but he wants us to go after Trump on policy and not him personally. So, any other thoughts? Of the takeaways from Sanders CNN town hall. Just that I hope he prepares a little better for the next one <laughs> because yeah, I did think he yeah. he seemed a little sleepy. He it's, wasn't as fiery as he was in the Fox News. It seems to me he acquiesces a, a little bit when it comes to the centrist Democrats. Like he's he's willing to go head on with the right wing, but then when it comes to the centrist Democrats, he seems like he sort of softens up. Yeah, that's exactly what he shouldn't be doing. He should be seeing them in the same view he sees people over at Fox News uh, as, I mean, not enemies, but he has to see them as a threat. He can't let his yeah. guard down. Which he opponents, did. yeah, exactly. Even though they're allies, even though the Democrats are technically uh, Bernies and our allies, they are still a threat, and they are still after him. So he needs to be up on on his game. Yeah, because it makes it look as though he has this false notion that the Republicans and the centrist Democrats are somehow different when they're not. They're they are the exactly. establishment. They are the deep state. You know. So exactly. Anyway. Um, I wanted to ask your thoughts about Bernie Sanders being perceived often by media as weak on foreign policy. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I hear if, if Bernie gets called out for anything, it's usually being weak on foreign policy, um, which which he actually owned up to. He mm -hmm. in the CNN town hall recently, he said something to the effect that uh, I need to do better uh, on right, foreign right. policy. So. I'll just say he's at least owning up to it and publicly owning up to it. And that just gives him so many more points because you can't attack that. He's being very honest and genuine that he needs help or needs work in that area. Interesting. What do you think? Yeah, I just think it's a false narrative, uh, again, that they're spewing out to make him seem as though he would be a weak choice for commander in chief. Because if you look at Bernie Sanders' history, not that he's perfect, but he has been more on target than nearly any senator in Congress, you know, with the Iraq war. Yeah, uh, yeah. He has uh, some missteps with Venezuela, but he came around. Uh, he's He passed the Wars Resolution Power Act, giving that power back to Congress. This is all foreign policy stuff that is right on target. Yeah, so yeah. I don't see where that idea that he's weak on foreign policy comes from, other than it was just manufactured. Yeah, I mean, like, he could be weak in some areas and they're just exploiting that or they're elaborating on it. But mm -hmm. like, like I mostly agree with everything he's done there with Venezuela and uh, the war powers act. He's done some really great things. So uh, it might just be his weakest link and it might not be as weak. Uh, they might be going after him uh, and exploiting the weakness, which really technically isn't that weak. It's oh, it sounds insane. Mm hmm. But I, I don't think he's that weak. But I will say it is one of his weaker spots uh, mm. in his platform. Now, are you saying that he doesn't speak about it that much? And that's what you mean by weakness or more his judgment? And Yeah, maybe weak uh, is the right word. Just not as vocal as he, he could be about it. Is that kind of what you're... Yeah, he, he could be more vocal. Like, he could definitely be more vocal. Um some people are arguing that he was an exponent of the Russian conspiracy theory. Uh, others said, well, he voted for the Iraqi sanctions. Uh, he voted for the war against Yugoslavia based on a lie. Some people he uh, said he supported Israel's attack on Gaza. Because when you look at Bernie Sanders on, on the domestic front, when you look at the domestic agenda, it's so strong. It's yeah, so okay. damn strong. So when we're putting that in context, his foreign mm -hmm. policy might look weaker because his domestic agenda is so airtight. 
and he's so mm-hmm. strong with the mess. So I think maybe if people are thinking putting those two side by side, foreign policy is going to look weaker than his domestic agenda. I see. Okay. Okay. That makes more sense. That's my but opinion. I think the uh, ultimate takeaway from this is he's better than most, but he's still compared to his own, I guess, platform. That's one of his weaker parts. Yeah. The, the foreign and, policy. And, and like I said, he owned up to it in the CNN town hall. He said he needs some work in some areas. Right. So mm-hmm. what else can we ask for him? You know? Right. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Okay. Did you by chance get to hear or watch the Marianne Williamson interview with Jimmy Dore? Uh, I actually didn't. So if you want to like talk about it, I'll, I'll be happy to add anything I can. Okay. There were some concerns uh, that she didn't seem to really know the difference between public option versus Medicare for all. That was one concern that was brought up. Another was when she was asked about Julian Assange, she sort of waffled. She didn't seem to want to support him, stating that she didn't really know whose side he was on, that he might be working with Russia in some way. She was implying it. She didn't say it directly. Those were some of the things that seemed to concern people from her yeah, uh, interview with Jimmy, Jimmy Dore. Okay, well, I can I can honestly say I, I'm with you on the, the Medicare for all, like how I believe everyone should mm-hmm. be back to the Sanders option, which is the gold standard, and how she supports the public option. I disagree with her on that. It doesn't seem like it matches her normal rhetoric, which is about humanity, Mm-hmm. Uh, like, because if, if you think about humanity and Medicare for all, you know, it naturally correlates to the one that covers everybody. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be a more humanitarian position uh, to make sure everyone was covered, make sure everyone had health care? Uh, so I, naturally, I would think someone like Marion Williamson would be naturally drawn to the Medicare for all that covers everybody uh, because her, meter- her rhetoric matches that plan, but it doesn't. She's she's pro Medicare for all uh, public option. And I just I couldn't disagree more with her when Jimmy Dore says we don't have a fourth estate anymore. We have pushers of propaganda with very loud microphones talking about Julian Assange. And now it's up to citizen journalists like himself. We debunked Russiagate for three years. And I'm wondering where you stand on this. I got a lot of ambivalence about Julian Assange. I, early on, I saw him as a whistleblower. OK, so. He's not even a whistleblower. <laughs> He's a journalist. So okay, he right. wouldn't even be protected under the whistleblower's protections because he's not breaking any laws, you know, with the government. He's not, you know, so I don't really see. He's a journalist. Journalist reports facts. Whistleblower would be someone who has made a commitment to the government in some way uh, to protect secret information. Um, like, and Snowden. Then it, like Snowden or Elsie Manning. used to get a few a, a prize for exposing someone okay this is just saying why she supported them initially in this last election however it's not as clear to me like who are you working for julian because why are you just going there for down on that campaign but not on the other campaign okay so this is where she said that she shifted her thinking initially she was all for julian Assange and the wikileaks but then during the 2016 election, it seemed as though all he would talk about was the Democrats and the Republicans could do no wrong. And she found that to be suspicious. And then okay. now she's sort of middle of the road and she doesn't really know what to make of that. OK, well, I mean, if she's being honest with that, I guess we'll give, give her points for being honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that might not fly with a lot of people on the left. Yeah. Uh, but I think. I'll give her some points for just for being honest if she believes that. So I can't really. Okay. All right. As far as I can well, go. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I know that you're not like a major supporter of her. So just. Yeah. Th- yeah. I'm, I'm still like. an. It doesn't like, really seem to phase you that much one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I still promote her. I still want her to get on the debate stage. I still think she's valuable. Uh, don't okay. get me wrong there. But, uh, you know, she needs to sew that up a little. Yeah, I agree. I do think her message about reparations, her message about reconciliation, Department of Peace, I do think, uh, just as you said, are worthy to at least be heard. Oh, absolutely. I want to see her on the debate stage in June. One of the other major topics that seemed to be going through social media recently regarding Andrew Yang, Rebel Headquarters, posted a video where he revealed 
more about his UBI. Did you see that video? Yeah, so they, yeah, and I, I did a video on it. Uh, it was about uh, the phase-in process uh, of UBI. Like he, uh, you know, Andrew Yang becomes president, and then he starts a phase-in uh, rollout, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the word trial came up, like like trials, a UBI trial, and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, are pretty angry about that. Like, what do you mean it, a trial? What, what what do you mean phase in? Like, these words are kind of catching people off guard. And they're saying Andrew Yang went from uh, everybody gets a thousand dollars a month, free and clear. It's universal. To hearing there's going to be trials, phase in, in language like that. That seems more gray to to mm -hmm. a lot of us. So we're trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do you think about that? Because it's kind of like, is it free and clear and universal, or is there going to be a trial period to figure out certain things? Uh, you know, it sounds muddy to me. Initially, I had a very similar reaction, being a bit surprised. This is the first I had heard of something like this. Okay. And my thought was, is he waffling on us? Is he losing confidence in his own policy? Uh, is he trying to fa find a way out? Uh, did someone speak and threaten him? You know, like what, why all of a sudden bring this up uh, two or three months into his campaign? And plus, it's not even mentioned on his website. So it's like, okay, I didn't see anything about a phase one, phase two, a trial period. I didn't see any of that. So, yeah, it was very disconcerting. And I, some of my confidence in him was shaken. Now that a few days have passed, however, I've been reading different Reddit streams and uh, thinking about it, I had to come to the understanding that he, when Bernie Sanders initially put out his Medicare for All, he didn't talk about phases. He didn't talk about how much it cost uh, when he was newer on the campaign trail back in 2015, 2016. Sure. It took him a while to bail things out. And eventually he started talking about uh, this is how much it will cost, this is how we're going to pay for it. And it even took him up to this this election season for him to finally say it's going to be a four-year phase-in period. It's going to take us four years. And I do think for a lot of people, the initial thought was when ta Bernie Sanders said Medicare for all, it was, okay, here's your piece of legislation. It gets passed. Everybody's got Medicare for all. Boom. You know? Right, uh, right. But it was an awakening when he put out his Medicare for all in 2019, showing you the phase-ins, you know, step A, B, C, D. It's like, OK, OK, that makes sense. And I think if you are an Andrew Yang follower, if you really are a hardcore follower and you've been really following his pathway, you understand this about him. He's newer to the show. Uh, he's kind of like learning as he goes, even. What's more important is that he gets his act together before the debates, at least to the point that he sounds like he knows what he's saying and how he means to do it, because he's going to be you know, asked these more detailed questions, you know. Do you mean do this on day one? Uh, you know, do you, how, how is this going to be paid for? Uh, are, is it going to be, a, you know, an experimental phase? Okay, this is my takeaway. Initially, my thought was legislation gets passed through Congress, uh, you know, by his backing, the American people's backing. Everybody's got UBI day one. That was my initial thinking. Same. Just based, based on the way he wrote his website, the way he talked about it so far on the camp, his campaign trail. Right. But after that video, my thinking was more like this was more like, well, I'm going to introduce a certain set of people into UBI, probably those most in need. We're going to see the results of it, which he thinks is going to be positive. And that's going to then provide more support to expand it further, that he's going to use that as a way to argue for everybody receiving UBI. Okay, yeah, that's, so, that's pretty sound. Uh, like, like, I am one of the people who has been following Andrew Yang since he announced in November of 2017. And I've paid attention to his rhetoric. I paid attention to his interviews and stuff like that. And it, it was like how you said, it's like everyone's getting $1,000 a month. For the longest time, I heard him say it's $1,000 a month. Everyone gets it, free and clear, mm -hmm. universal. Mm -hmm. These very yeah. absolutist terms, right? right. Okay. Now, now it seems like he's at that point, like Bernie was too, everybody's getting Medicare for all and that's it. But now it's, there's a point where you have to unpack the details, the finer details, comb over the points. And I think that's what Andrew Yang is doing. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here is that he's mm -hmm. unpacking some of those details that might have stunted uh, the, 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 the popularity of the policy in the first place.
when we start hearing trials and, and phase ins and rollouts and it's very complex language. So he started off with the basics. He kept it simple and very to the, very much to the point. Now we're starting to get some details and we're kind of like having a reaction to it because it's like, whoa, right. for right. the longest time. He's been saying right. that 2017. So Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I think is going on there. Um, like you, I'm just going to give him a benefit of doubt. He's kind of phasing things in. You call even Bernie Sanders in 2016 started out with only Medicare. Eventually went to Medicare for all. And then eventually even opened up the conversation regarding the plan, the phase in over four years. It seems to me that's probably what uh, Yang is doing as well. Yeah, yeah, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. However, I wanted to talk about his moving the age from 18 to 64, now 18 plus, and your thoughts on those receiving Social Security having to opt in by giving up whatever they have, uh, say less than $1,000 from Social Security, in order to opt into UBI. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I'm, I'm leaning towards not liking the opt-in. I'm leaning towards wing UBI, where it goes to benefits that are on top mm -hmm. of, of, of existing benefits. I mean, mm -hmm. especially, let's, let's try to focus on Social Security. Uh, that someone's been paying into their whole lives, right? Um, you know, no one that shouldn't even be tampered with. That should not be, you know, negotiated in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe that you know those people should get the thousand dollars that is claimed to be universal, that is claimed to be free and clear. They should get it too. So that's just how I feel about it. What, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I've gone through a few stages with this, and I just hope it's not me wanting to uh, pick, you know, secure the bag mindset. But um, <laughs> hashtag right. And so this is what I um, my first problem was when I heard that those on social welfare programs had to either forgo their welfare checks or whatever their welfare support in order to opt into UBI. Um, sure, that was concerning for me because. My initial framing of UBI was right or wrong, uh, that it was about trying to help those most in need. And obviously, Andrew Yang's UBI doesn't do that. Uh, that's not its end goal. That's what I've had to learn along the pathway. The end goal has always been to stimulate, to assist people, to ca help catalyze them out of a maybe desperate situation or uh, try to get them to have upward mobility. That's really the end goal of UBI, to give you a right. a right of citizenship. And the idea is not that UBI answers every question, but more that UBI is there to say, every citizen at least, it, at least, at the very minimum, deserves to start in, not at zero, but at least at $1,000 a month. And whatever form that comes, or whatever shape that comes, isn't as important as that it comes, you know, whether it's through the form of social security, whether it's through the form of the freedom dividend, whether it's in the form of social welfare programs, everybody starts in with a thousand dollars. That sort of answered that for me regarding the social welfare programs. That sort of makes sense to me because you're already getting a thousand dollars from, from the government. So you're not really losing anything. Right. Um, now, I had more difficulty with the 65 and, or 64 and older because, as you said, uh, people put into this their hard-earned cash. Um, they put into so their Social Security for the future, so they bought it. You know, this is something they own. Exactly. So how is it that they then have to turn around and give up what they earned in order to receive what everybody else is receiving already? Who doesn't have to give up anything? Why? Yeah. That, that's been a sticking point for me, most definitely. And I can see a lot of other people on, on uh, this channel, probably on your channel as well, Dave, I'm sure you've seen this, that have yep. also seen this as a sticking point. Yeah, yeah. I, people get hung up on this probably the most. Uh, and I'm definitely there with you. Like, that's their money. They bought into it. I mean, they paid it their whole lives. Why should that be option or negotiated? You know, it's just kind of like, Mm -hmm. It doesn't add up. And it just it strips away, you know, the universality of UBI. It's, it's saying 
it's giving UBI less credibility, at least Andrew Yang's version, because it takes away of it being free and clear and universal. Th those are these are some you know deep stipulations to to UBI. There's a lot of stipulations here. Um, so, but I want to also bring forth another point that was mentioned on the Humanist Report. He had said UBI isn't meant to fix Social Security. Uh, that is a different issue altogether. That it needs to be looked at. It needs to be made solvent. It needs to be made strong. That sure. he wants to address that separate from universal basic income. That's the way he's looking at it. That was his answer. That's the best that I've so far heard from him addressing this concern. I, I understand the unfairness of it. You know, the unfairness aspect of this. Uh, you know, but do you think that that's enough to distract from the benefits that can be derived? universally from UBI. Is it still good enough is what you're saying? Like, Yeah, I mean, does it, okay, let's say that it's really good. Like, uh, let's say that the benefits definitely outweigh the negatives. Does that still justify presenting a program that is unfair to a segment of the population? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I know what you're saying. Because I think, I think that in that episode you're referring to, Mike Figueredo, he used his dad uh, mm -hmm. or his mother, no, his mother in the, in the equation that she's only getting $600 a month right now right. in social right. security. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it would greatly benefit her because she would make, she would net plus 400 a month. Uh, or, and then you could use anybody. If someone's making 800 a month, they'll get net 200 a month, getting 950 a month. It's net $50. So, you know, it rounds up. So there are some benefits there and it's obviously better than not implementing it at all you know the more we talk dave the more what i'm getting from andrew yang's vision the impetus of what he's doing what he's trying to achieve is he's trying to raise the floor he and how he does it he's not looking at trying to be universally fair he's not trying to be like okay well i've covered everybody but what he really wants to do is he wants to move everybody from zero to one thousand and Okay. If you're already at 1,000, great. If you aren't, I'm going to get you there. Right, yeah. That's that's a better way to reframe it. That's kind of the way I'm looking at it. That's the only way that I can really justify it in my mind, ultimately, from a sort of moralistic or ethical standpoint. That's kind of the way I can, the only way that I can really come around. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, he, I'm hearing right-wingers say people on disability are already getting, you know, their freedom dividend. Uh, you know, basically. So it's like, you know, so it's basically like in the people who aren't getting disability, you know, are, you know, they, they need the help. They need that thousand dollars. But so do the, I mean, but so do people who are living off of, you know, their, their earned benefits. Um, well, let's put it this way. At the very, very minimum, everybody, including those receiving a social security check are going to be receiving a thousand dollars a month. That's $12,000 a year. If you receive more than that, then great. You just opt yeah. out of UBI. Right. Yeah. These kinks all have to be worked out along the way. And and I, I'm thinking like it's stuff like this that Congress likely f will fail at getting something passed because Nixon Nixon passed it twice. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. In, in the House. And it failed in the Senate twice. Well, I'm going to bring up like, a point I, that uh, one of uh, commenters on my channel had said that really struck a chord with me. And that is the tendency for citizens to always forget about the power. The same thing that Bernie Sanders said, not me, us. You know, it's not right. about Congress. It's about us activating and getting excited about something I think most people can get excited about and talking to everybody, activating people to the point we oust Congress and if necessary in the midterms in order to get UBI. That's really where it's at, you know. Um, and any other I mean, discussion is know. just acquiescing and giving our power away to Congress, right? I mean, right, yeah, but we need Congress to pass the legislation, right? Correct. Uh, we, like Andrew, Andrew Yang cannot, I found out that Yang cannot do like an executive order uh, to get UBI passed. He has to go through Congress. So it's, you know, it's a valid question. Like, well, I, do think it, I think it's a act. valid question. I think it's a, va a valid question, but I also think that just as Andrew Yang needs Congress, Congress needs us. Sure. Yeah, it works both ways. But we can argue the same thing regarding Bernie Sanders, you know, and his Medicare for all. I'm sure it's not as though he appears, uh, you know, as president 
uh, year one and it's like oh i want medicare for all and there it is you know easy breezy you know <laughs> there'll be a fight absolutely and we, it might be that it ends up being medicare instead of medicare for all and he'll just have to say all right i'll sign it you mean like you mean like take like a public option like no 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 i'm saying it could be that he wants medicare for all he wants you know long-term care covered he wants dental care covered he wants audio he wants vision but when they when it all chips all fall down he might have to settle with medicare not medicare for all okay yeah he might he might say okay 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 i get it i'll sign it you know and it might be andrew yang will have to settle with 500 dollars a month or something like that you know yeah i mean there's always there's always compromise right like it's right. part of the process there's bipartisanship compromises and that's why even Mike Figueredo, uh, the humanist report, was saying that's why you set the bar high because right. when you meet when you meet up with the Republicans, you're likely going to take a compromise. It makes perfect sense. And this is why Democrats should be progressive Democrats because progressive Democrats are going to set the bar really high. Then they're going to meet with the Republicans and they're going to chop it down a little. You know, mm -hmm. when you have a wing Democrat, okay, and then that gets chopped down. You get a lot of right wing results, you know what I mean? So it's kind of right, like right. set the bar high. Uh, um, mm -hmm. So when you take the compromise, it's not going to be that bad. Uh, like a compromise I would see would be a public option. That's the lowest compromise I think anybody should take for Medicare for all. That should be the lowest bar here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Not, not some ACA reboot or any of that crap. Uh, the lowest bar should be Medicare for all public option. But You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, that is that is truth that when you have primaries, they tend to get stuck in their uh, respective bubbles, in this case, the Democrat bubble. You know, they they don't they forget that there are Republicans over here on the other side of the aisle. <laughs> you know, so, no, no, right. So you're yeah, right. Exactly. You have to set the bar. High. Just set the bar high, you know. Right. Right. I agree. Um, yeah, that's kind of a. That my thoughts on the freedom dividend. I, I mean, it's taken me time to come around to the idea that uh, it's not a fix-all. You know, it's raising the it's raising the floor. That's really what we're trying to achieve here. It's supplemental. It's not supposed to be, a, you know, a replacement for work or anything. It's supposed to be strictly supplemental. And people who are getting supplemental uh, things from the government, you know, are being factored into this equation, uh, and it comes about fairness. And uh, there's a mm -hmm. lot, of, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of question, questions to ask here. But but he also talked about he also talked about how uh, one of the uh, design, the the sort of the intrinsic design of UBI works the effect of getting people off being stigmatized to not want yes. to work because that you know they they lose all that money or or that benefit, as you know so. I think that yeah, there's yeah, that, yeah. and then all the people yeah. that do work, you know, the caregivers, the mothers, that you know, uh, taking care of yeah. the grandparents, you know, these are things that are not factored into the value of society. So there really is an overall, I think, a, a, a benefit to this. Yeah, even if for Andrew Yang's his, his bill as is right now gets passed, it's definitely mm -hmm. beneficial for society. Way beneficial. We're just trying to optimize and maximize. Another one, too, that often does get talked about, let's say that you have uh, four or five siblings and their grand their grandparents, let's say they make $1,200 a, uh, a month and they don't get UBI. But you have all these kids over here that are much better in a much better position to, you know, have the grandparent move in or whatnot or help her out, you know, financially, if, if that, you know, hiring a caregiver because they get that extra money. So they are being indirectly benefited, even though it's not monetary. So it's not just about the tangible benefits, it's about all the intangible benefits that go with that as well. And I think lastly on this is that what really sold me is when I heard him talk about that this is just the beginning, you know, that if he gets reelected, he would work to get it raised to 2000 You know, it's not about keeping it fixed at $1,000 a month, and that's just it, and end of, you know, end of story, you know. But it's a long-term vision that he has exchanging automation for UBI, you know, just sort of like they cross at some point. So makes sense to me. Yeah, I got to hear anyway. I, I never I haven't heard that yet. I haven't heard about the, the increase for the second term. I got to mm -hmm. catch that interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely look for that one. That was that was the point where it sort of uh, rang true to me because that he's in it for the long term. You know, it's not just a trying to get elected type of thing.
So yeah, and he's being accused of that. He's saying there's a lot of people saying uh, Andrew Yang is just using UBI as a ploy to get elected. So right, yeah, buying yeah, votes. Right, yeah, and I don't think he. That brings me to the next topic I, I wanted to kind of segue into, and that is uh, on this channel, both Dave and I, we try to be as non-biased as we can. So we try to be very even in our discussions. And um, we, talk, we talk very positively about UBI and why we ultimately support it. But on the flip side, we also support Medicare for All. And so I wanted just an analysis of these two so that not to discourage anyone from one or the other, but more just thinking out loud together here at Progressive Talk. Let's start with some of the benefits of Medicare for All over UBI. And then we'll talk about benefits UBI over Medicare for All. What are your thoughts, Dave? So benefits of Medicare for all over, over, UBI? over UBI, yeah. Never having a hospital bill, never having a copay, never having to worry about medical bills, period. <laughs> the, the coverage is obviously deeper and more than $1,000 a month uh, because medical bills can stack up to the tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands. And it's like, well, what's $1,000 a month going to do for that? It really, it really depends, obviously, on, on the care you, you would get or the injury you sustained or the surgery you had. But And even the age that you get it. So you might get it the first year of receiving UBI and you don't have any savings account. Then, you then of course, you're devastated. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I don't know. I all I know is that people would rather have UBI, a thousand bucks in their in, in, in their pocket, than have mm -hmm. Medicare for all. That's and I'm just gauging that in the Yang gang like. A lot right. of my Yang followers are really more adamant for UBI over Medicare for all because I because I keep saying I want Medicare for all for everybody and they're like ah who cares who cares just get the thousand get the bag secure the bag uh, so I would say most Yang gangers are for UBI over Medicare for all and any whether thing like but I don't know if it if that's really the best way to go here yeah I did have some difficulties understanding why. Andrew Yang didn't just come out for Medicare for all. That always struck me as odd. I, I don't know right. what, what the problem is here. You know, okay, raise people's taxes 3 4%, and everybody gets covered, and we're done deal. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, is he he's overtly concerned about, oh, what is it? He was concerned about the rollout, but then mm -hmm. Mike Figueredo on the Humanist Report called him out and said Sanders' bill has a four-year rollout. You know, it mm -hmm. would take care of that. We don't need more than four years to roll this out. OK. Right. And, and Andrew Yang says it's not enough time, you know, a public option, be a buffer zone between uh, the transfer, make everyone come to it naturally and organically. And it's just like we don't have to go through that. Okay. Also, it seems when, to me that Medicare for all has been much more thought about by the American public, you know, and we've had to build a consensus over a number of years and we've built up to swell now yeah. and it's ready for that you know and it seems like exactly. you could miss that opportunity you know sort of the train is here let's get get on board before it, it leaves again you know that's my biggest concern if there's ever a concern that would be my biggest concern now with ubi you know it's just starting to enter the consciousness of the american people it's just beginning the discussion is just starting now you know people are just starting to get on board so it doesn't feel like a train that we need to be concerned about we need to get this now you know we need to do it now because if we don't do it now we're going to lose it um so that's that to me is probably the biggest argument um okay. of medicare for all over ubi so we built up uh, all this momentum with with medicare for all and we better pounce on it is what you're saying yeah yeah that, now, again, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here, so don't any of you listeners don't interpret it mean I'm saying I'm for Medicare for all over UBI. We're, Dave and I are having an open political progressive talk discussion here. So, But, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. It seems to me if there was any argument for Medicare for all over UBI, it would be that one. I haven't thought about that yet. Like, there has been so much investment building over the years why and why why are we going to let that go away seven and ten americans right now want a medicare for all uh, it's just why aren't we pouncing why would andrew yang take a middle of the road position to something that's so um, that a majority of americans want you know what i'm saying like mm -hmm. it seems odd that anybody's taking a middle of the road position on something this popular i do think it's not the wisest position to take i mean i think it's a smart guy and for the most part i think almost everything that he has set forth has yes. been 
just groundbreaking and well thought out and smart and just brilliant, really brilliant. But this is one of them that has just always struck me as odd and beneath, even beneath him in some way. So I don't really know what his angle is on that. I don't get it. The only thing that, I, that I've heard him say a couple times is similar to Pete Buttigieg, where he talks about, you said that four years is not enough, that we need to convince the American people, we need to get people behind it. And yet, like we just argue, the people are behind it, you know. Right. I don't like Maybe he's talking about... I think at one point he talked about the impact on the economy, if I recall correctly, yes. that if we were to try to switch over to Medicare for all, that might have too much of a devastating effect on the U.S. economy, particularly where we are right now. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, did, anyway, I did hear that. But, let me yeah. just ask you one more last one last question on that. If we were to get into Andrew Yang's mind, do you think he does or does not really support Medicare for all? Oh, it's such a good question. Uh, I want to know the answer to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I think he has a lot of good intentions. I believe he's empathic. I mean, hey, he was goth. Like, he's a long-suffering person. He was a <laughs> – he could be our first gothic president. I mean, like, like I think he wants to go there, but something is, st- is stopping him from doing it, and I want to know what it is. Mm-hmm. I believe he believes uh, there could be some uh, political, you know, uh, roadblock – that mm-hmm. is blocking him from supporting the Medicare for all that covers everybody. I read him as someone who cares. Like, I yeah. believe he cares. He's just not an empty suit. He really cares about policy. He cares about regular people's lives. Uh, so, you know, why wouldn't he go all the way with Medicare for all? And it's kind of like, it's a good question. Like, what's mm-hmm. stopping him? Yeah, we'll continue to discuss that in future progressive talks. But definitely one I'd like to iron out a little more. Um, sure. Just kind of get his thinking on it. Um, so let's transition to our last topic uh, of the day here on Progressive Talk, and that is, uh, I don't know if you heard the speech that Trump gave yesterday regarding the uh, claims that babies are legally being executed. Did you see that? I did. What an abomination. Yeah, he's 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 gotten to the point where it's just the lies are so plain, clear, and overt. Uh, you know, and it all goes back to like the, the the GOP has nothing to offer here except fear. You know, they don't care about health care, they don't care about net neutrality, they don't care about the Green New Deal, they don't care about fight for 15. They don't have no policy substance to really fall back on. The tax plan was a disaster, mm-hmm. okay, uh, and and everything else they do is a disaster. Uh, so they have racism, they have a racist wall, and then they have, uh, you know, fear, just anything fear-based. Now right. it's so off the rails that he's saying women and doctors at the point of birth, coercing together to kill the child as soon as as soon as as soon it's born, mm-hmm. just because they want to. No right. reasons because they want to. And so this, I believe, is in response to a recent New York State law passed that allows abortions after 24 weeks if the mother's health is at risk and what was added on is if there's an absence of fetal viability you know being determined by the doctor after the doctor has tried everything in their power to keep the baby alive that's what the legislation was about that was passed in new york and of course trump is taking and twisting it to favor his rhetoric Radical Democrats, they're killing, uh, you know, the sky is falling, uh, just anything hyperbolic to to get the blood boiling, to get, you know, just it's so disingenuous. And it's basically like stochastic terrorism where you're mm. energizing the most radical parts of your base by, mm-hmm. by feeding them toxic lies that can incite violence. Do you think that this rhetoric... Um, the old guard of the establishing Republicans, the, the Republicans, really. Do you think it's on its way out? It's on its last breath? Or do you think it has any chance of resurrecting itself? And, and I mean, I do see some signs of that. I just am curious. Do you feel like it's just a anomaly and it's just a small part of the whole and it's not going to take hold? Or do we have some concerns or fears of that of resurrecting itself? Yeah, uh good question i i honestly don't know if it is you know it might be like like in 
10 to 20 years, I don't foresee the GOP being dominant Relevant. just because what, mm-hmm. what because the data shows that the, the, the majority of young Americans are left wing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're going to be pushed out, whether they're, you know, they're literally dying off, right? The baby boomers and, you know, uh, a lot of the old guards literally dying off. But the data all points to a blue America in the next 20 years. So I, I do believe they are, they're on their way out one way or the other uh, because the data basically says so. It seems like but, the future battle will be between centrist establishment types, third way types and the progressives really. So what, in the libertarians, progressives versus the establishment, Republicans, Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. I can yeah. see that. Um, so just to clarify, this law removes abortion from the criminal code and places it entirely within the realm of public health law. Performing a late term abortion had previously been a felony in New York, had a chilling effect on doctors in New York who were reluctant to provide abortions after 24 weeks when the mother's life was in danger or the fetus was no longer viable. In a widely reported case, one New York woman had to travel to Colorado to terminate her pregnancy when she found out after 31 weeks that the baby she was carrying would not survive outside the womb. So this is to protect the doctor to perform that abortion, the non-viable fetus, because the fetus would be in enormous amounts of suffering or was going to essentially pass away in a very gruesome way without the humanitarian hands of the doctor that that's really what that is about it has nothing to do with doctors and just people just oh i've got a healthy baby here let me wait and let me wait nine months and now it comes out let's, <laughs> let's conspire together and let's it's suffocate so it with silly. the pillow <laughs> it, it, it's so it's silly but it's scary that people can actually take his word mm-hmm. and, and think it's gospel like that is scary it's absolutely silly of the world that we live in so exactly and you know in in this day and age that shouldn't be happening with all the tools and resources we have there's no excuse to not be informed uh so much of this just comes down to ignorance and and like tribalism and just so many toxic elements of the human condition it's just it's unbelievable that it's happening in this day and age where you have accessible information that's vetted that that's proven and, you know, we still have, you know, people, we have the president of the United States saying that doctors and in, in, in women carrying their kid to birth are just killing them as soon as they're born. I mean, this right. is insanity. This is yeah. literal insanity. But I think it's it's lazy. It's easy. Uh, you know, we can find something to blame, something to scapegoat That's for it. our own miseries, our own problems. That's why I think that uh, someone like Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang uh, really is the answer. You know, they're the antidote to someone like Trump, you know, uh, and, not and then, Donald Trump, but the, the the essence of that misinformed body politic, you know. Exactly. So. And, and that's what that's what and because the GOP has nothing to offer. Once again, they have nothing to offer. So they have to attack uh, from these really hyper political angles like abortion or whether it's gay rights, trans rights, or whatever, because they can't offer anything, you know, that because the, the Democrats are actually the ones who are offering something. They were offering Medicare for all. We're offering, uh, you know, a Green New Deal, a Fight for 15, UBI. We have all these policies that we're talking about, and they have nothing. They're, they, they can't counter policy, so they're going to go with, like, the most vicious smearing mm-hmm. and, and fear-mongering, because it's the only way they can counteract it, and it's it's... Yeah, I hope people can see through it because it's pretty easy on this end. But who knows? It, it also made me think of uh, I don't know who it was, but it was some fam- famous f- politician or or um, political figure who had said that the biggest mistake the Republican Party had ever made was aligning with the fundamentalist Christians and the evangelicals uh, as their um, 
voter block and that has since haunted them and may be their undoing because that's what they're hanging on to. Their last gasp of air is hanging on to that old paradigm. What I find interesting is you have Donald Trump that recognizes that fact, that that's where yep. his power lies. And that's why he's transforming the lower courts into all these conservative religious judges, because ultimately he feeds into that frenzy of religious fascist paradigm. That That's what how he propagates his power. And, and begins to feed into the corporate machine, you know, that he's part of. And well, how much did he make off this last tax uh, increase? I think someone somewhere I had read that he he gained like 15, 20 billion dollars just for this tax cut, just like since it, it was enacted him personally. You know? So <laughs> so corrupt. And people still think that he's on their side. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've never seen anything like it. It's just straight up delusional. Anyway. Most reality here. So, yeah, this is the reason why we need to get out and support people like Andrew Yang, Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie Sanders, because they are, the, you know, they are the antidote to this Trump effect that is currently happening here in America. That's what I encourage everybody to donate. Oh, I think uh, one last thing I wanted to point out. Don't forget to donate to Marianne Williamson's website. Uh, I think she's up to needing about 15,000 don- individual donors to get on the debate stage. Mike Gravel, he is he has about 20,000 at this point. So he's got a, he's got a long way to go and he's got about 15 to 20 days to do it. So okay, everybody, yeah. your wallet, your purses, one dollar is is all, all it's going to take to get him on that stage. I think Marianne Williamson needs like between six and seven thousand right now. So she's right oh, on the cup. So she's right there. And don't forget that you don't want Tulsi Gabbard to be the only person on that stage speaking out against the military industrial complex. You know, Bernie Sanders, as good as he is behind closed doors, you know, as good as he is getting the, you know, War Powers Act in place and voting against the Iraq war, he's he tends to be a little mum when it comes to standing up against the complex. So you don't want Telsey by herself. So that's why if you are a Telsey Gabbard supporter right now and you're listening, you've got to amplify that voice. Put it in stereo by donating it. At, all you do, one dollar to Mike Gravel's page. Get him up to that sixty five thousand. He'll be on there. In stereo with Tulsi. I apologize, everyone, for misinforming, but I believe it's actually May the 15th is, is the cutoff. Is so, it? Yeah, that's oh, wow. my understanding. So l- please look into that. If anybody knows, correct me. So don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty certain it's May the 15th. OK, so, Dave, uh, I think that wraps it up for progressive talk number three. Final words before we talk next uh, progressive talk. Oh, you aired me out over here. I just think I don't think I have nothing left in the tanks, buddy. All right. All right. Well, it's been a pleasure, Dave, as always. And we'll see you next week here on Progressive Talk. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.